Ready, two, three, four. Oh, it's hard. Greetings. I'm Joe Shields, Vice President for Research and Creative Activity and Dean of the Graduate College. At Ohio University, we strive to provide our students at all levels outstanding educational experiences to allow them to move forward in their lives and careers. This effort is deeply intertwined with the university's mission for the creation of new knowledge through research and creative activity. We're pleased to take this opportunity to showcase one of our faculty who is outstanding as both a researcher and a mentor of students. Dr. Brian Clark is a professor of physiology in the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine, where he holds the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation Harold E. Clyburn DO Endowed Research Chair, and also serves as his executive director of the Ohio Musculoskeletal Neurological Institute, which we refer to as by its acronym of OMNI. Dr. Clark is highly regarded internationally for his work on aging and pain, which has attracted major funding from the National Institutes of Health. And we're also very grateful to the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation for their support for his endowed chair and for the growth of Omni. Dr. Clark is continuing Ohio University's tradition of carrying out translational research, which leads to discoveries that can be translated or moved out of the laboratory to benefit people in medical and community settings. He serves on the steering committee for the Translational Biomedical Sciences doctoral program, a rapidly growing interdisciplinary initiative housed in the Graduate College that leverages the talent of more than 50 faculty drawn from five colleges across the university to train the next generation of researchers to engage with the big challenges of the 21st century biomedical science. Dr. Clark has extended his translational efforts to include entrepreneurship by working with others to create a startup company that we hope will make the results of Ohio University research available broadly as a diagnostic in medical settings. Dr. Clark will be telling us today about his research and its potential in his presentation on innovations in osteoporosis diagnosis. Okay, so thank you Dr. Shields for the kind words in the introduction. Uh, your office, the Vice President's for Research Office in OU has always been very supportive of our research for which we're very grateful. Um, as Dr. Schild says, I want to talk a little bit today about some of the work that we're doing here at Ohio University seeking to improve the diagnosis of osteoporosis. So many people uh, today are familiar with osteoporosis, which is great from a public health perspective. That's been decades in the coming to raise awareness with it. But for those who may not be, osteoporosis is a disease characterized by low bone mass and structural deterioration of bone tissue that ultimately can lead to bone fragility or weakness and an increased risk of fractures, namely of the hip, spine, and wrist. Uh, down here I have it easily surmised, osteoporosis, fragile bones that fracture easily. So bone mass, if we look at its relationship throughout the lifespan, on the left side of the figure here, there's two things I want you to note. One is that during the teenage years in particular, the majority of our bone mass is accrued, shown here. Uh, and by about the age of 20 to 30, we hit our peak level of bone mass. And then after that time, there's generally speaking a gradual decline and women are being illustrated in light blue with the men in the hatched bars, so this is just illustrating that men tend to have higher bone mass, but I want to note that uh, both men and women lose bone mass with age. So there's two take-homes that I want you to have from that. The first take-home is how important it is to increase your skeletal health in those pubertal years. So for those of you who have children uh, or, or grandchildren, those early years, shown here in the, you know, the, the five, six, seven, eight years, up to 20 years of age range, that's really the time period of life that we can improve our skeletal health most robustly uh, through physical activity and good nutrition. The other thing I want to note is that there is this slow, gradual decline, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, there's different rates. You could imagine uh, some individuals that uh, rapidly decline, whereas others don't. 
Uh, and again, as we'll talk a little bit more later about some very applied things, uh, physical activity and nutrition are huge components to skeletal health. Now, the reason we're obviously worried about skeletal health is because if you hit a, uh, a certain precipice or a certain tipping point, you become at increased risk of fracture. And shown here in the right, it's showing that the rates of fracture per year dramatically increase as we get older. Uh, these middle years here where you start to see these ticking up are starting at about 65 years of age uh, in women. For men, it's a little later at 70, 75 years of age, and that's because men tend to have a little higher peak bone mass. Uh, the yellow bar or the, or the green bar here is showing uh, wrist fractures, uh, sorry, wrist fractures, vertebral fractures, and hip fractures. Uh, the burden of osteoporosis is, is quite frankly, it's enormous. Uh, in one's lifetime, one out of three women are expected to experience a fragility fracture, and one out of five men are expected to experience a fragility fracture totaling nearly 9 million fractures annually in the United States. That's one fracture every three seconds. Um, the proportion of this is supposed to expect it to dramatically increase over the next 30 years or so, in large part because of the graying of the nation. Uh, this figure on the left is highlighting that fragility fractures are the fourth most burdensome chronic disease uh, the highest ranked uh, chronic disease is ischemic heart disease, followed by dementia, lung cancer, fragility fractures, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, stroke, Parkinson's disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. So if we think about this from sort of a uh, disability and mortality perspective overall, it's a very burdensome chronic disease. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things. Many people have uh, seen individuals who may have what we refer to as the dowager's hump. This is a classic sign of someone who has experienced numerous vertebral fractures over the course of their life uh, because of poor bone health that has resulted in this particular case of extreme changes in posture and stature. This is also a key reason for why we lose height as we get older. What I'm ex trying to illustrate here on the far left is normal healthy bone and osteoporotic bone. This is a micrograph, very zoomed in tight image of what healthy bone looks like and what osteoporotic bone looks like. And as you can see, the, uh, the degradation uh, of the bone has occurred, making it weak. Um, osteoporosis accounts for more days in the hospital than any other diseases. Uh, including breast cancer, uh, heart attack, uh, diabetes, and others. That's for individuals over the age of 45 at least. Um, and it has a fracture risk up to 20 times higher for men than prostate cancer risk. Uh, if someone has a hip fracture, which is the, clearly the worst kind of a fracture to experience, 40% uh, of individuals are unable to walk. Uh, independently, 60% require assistance a year later, uh, and sadly there's a 20 to 25% uh, mortality rate in the first year after a hip fracture. So what can we do to improve our skeletal health? On the left, I'm trying to illustrate modifiable risk factors, and on the right, we're trying to illustrate non-modifiable risk factors. So for instance, excessive alcohol intake is well known to uh, result in poorer bone health. Uh, smoking, smoking pretty much <laughs> results in everything being poor in our, our, our body, including our, our bone mass and our bone strength. Uh, low body mass index, so someone that is just very uh, slight in stature tends to have uh, considerably lower um, skeletal strength. Uh, poor nutrition, eating disorders such as anorexia, this is in particular I want to highlight if I go back to that first slide where I talked about those teenage years being so critical for optimal skeletal health development. If you couple that time period with say uh, an eating disorder of anorexia and insufficient exercise, you've got a uh, uh, tumultuous trifecta for long-term uh, instances of poor skeletal health. And some people will refer to osteoporosis as a, a disease of childhood, that it's sort of manifesting itself later. Uh, as I said, insufficient exercise is a modifiable risk factor. Having low dietary calcium intake is a modifiable risk factor. Similarly, vitamin D deficiency, 
and frequent falling. Individuals who experience frequent falling are at a much higher rate of uh, fracture risk simply because if you fall and it places a, a load onto the bone, they're at an increased risk of breaking a bone. There are a large number of non-modifiable risk factors, things we can't change, such as our age, uh, our, our biological sex, um, the family history, you know, genetic predispositions. That's a family history or a personal history of prior fractures. Uh, race and ethnicity is also an issue. Uh, Caucasians and Asians tend to have higher risks of fragility fractures or, or lower uh, bone strength. Uh, early menopause or hysterectomies, long-term glucocorticoid therapies, as well as primary or secondary hypogonadism in men are all non-modifiable risk factors. So what can you do to protect yourself? Well, there's a few things you can do. One is you can try to prevent falls. Uh, 10 to 15 percent of falls in seniors result in a fracture, so if you can do things to mitigate falls, that can mitigate your fracture risk. This includes things such as having good lighting in your house so that you can see the floor, uh, removing rugs that tend to be trip hazards, things of that nature. Um, there are medications that um, have very robust effects and reduce fracture risk. And then there's the sort of the modifiable lifestyle factors that mainly relate to physical activity uh, as well as good nutrition, particularly a diet that's rich in calcium and protein and vitamin D, as well as exercise that's load bearing. And by load bearing, I mean physical activity that literally places a load through the bone. So for instance, uh, swimming would not be as robust of a stimulus for skeletal adaptation as many of the load bearing activities uh, simply because it's not taking the load up. So in many of these cases, for instance, the medication route, you would probably want to know whether or not you had good or bad or somewhere in between bone health. So the clinical uh, standard currently for diagnosing osteoporosis is a dual energy x-ray absorptiometry scan, commonly called a DEXA scan or a bone scan. Many, if not most women over probably 50 to 60 have had one of these. They're not as common amongst men until, uh, until we get older in large part because of that peak accrual of bone mass is higher in men. Uh, but this is your classic DEXA scanner where an individual is lying on a table and there's two different x-ray beams that are passed through the body and based on the absorption of bone versus fat versus muscle of the x-ray, it can quantify the density of the bone. So it's a chemical parameter that quantifies the density of the bone. And it's a very simple, non-invasive procedure, and it literally takes less than 10 to 20 minutes to accomplish this. Most commonly, they'll test the lumbar spine and the hip. Um, the rub, though, is that bone mineral density does not predict fractures well. Uh, I've spoken with numerous key opinion leaders over the years, and the classic comment they'll make is that Bone mineral density is the best we've got, which is why we use it, but it's far from a robust predictor of fractures. Uh, this is, over here is just some data uh, illustrating that amongst, uh, this is the lumbar spine and the total hip, and this is individuals who are normal, this is individuals who are being classified as osteopenic, this is individuals that are being classified as osteoporotic. Osteopenic means you've got a little bit uh, lower bone mineral density. Osteoporotic means that you're substantially less than the average population. You're, you're more than two and a half standard deviations away from the normal population mean. And what I want to point out, I think the easiest one to see here, is that there are actually more fractures amongst osteopenic patients than there are amongst osteoporotic patients, at least for the hip. And there's similar um, fracture cases for the lumbar spine between osteopenic and osteoporotic, suggesting that it doesn't predict fractures all that well. And one of the likely reasons for this is that as we get older, the rate of loss of the kind of bone that we have changes. So there's two different kinds of bones. There's what we refer to as trabecular bone, or the spongy bone that sits inside the bone. And then there's the outer shell, the hard outer shell of the bone that's called the cortical bone. Dual energy x-ray absorptiometry measuring bone mineral density is largely reflective of this trabecular bone. It's largely reflective of the amount of density that exists inside the trabecular bone. But if you look, this was a paper from The Lancet uh, from uh, about 10 years ago. 
and they looked at across the lifespan the rate of loss of cortical bone versus trabecular bone. And what I want to point out is that starting at around 65 years of age, running to greater than 80 years of age, we lose substantially more cortical bone, shown in green, than we lose of trabecular bone. But because DEXA is largely reflective of that trabecular bone, that's likely one of the reasons it doesn't do a great job of explaining fracture risk. Additionally, bone mineral density from DEXA is again measuring a chemical property, not a mechanical property. So it's not necessarily measuring bone strength. In fact, most studies that look at the relationship between the density of the bone and the actual strength of the bone suggest that density only explains about half of the variability uh, in bone strength. So it's not a robust predictor of bone strength. And this has led to papers such as the one I'm showing here, which had a clever title, Osteoporosis, the Emperor Has No Clothes. Uh, and this is highlighting that there is a large amount of error in uh, the dual energy x-ray absorpti absorptiometry scan, uh, suggesting that it's probably not the most robust, accurate predictor of skeletal health, at least what we would want. Um, so this brings us to some of the work that we've been doing here at Ohio University, trying to ultimately improve the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Uh, this started about 10 years ago in Ann Lauks's lab. Uh, Ann uh, recently retired. She was a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, and her husband, Ann's in the far left, and her husband, Lynn Bowman, uh, he's an electrical engineer out of Stanford uh, who had retired and started working in her lab. And over the course of several years, Ann's interests were in skeletal health, particularly amongst um, women athletes. And she had an interest in trying to actually quantify those mechanical properties, things like bone strength or stiffness. And Lynn had worked on some of this kind of technology when he was a graduate student at Stanford many years ago. So he started working in her lab trying to build something uh, so that she could accomplish what she was interested in doing. And this was one of the first prototypes that he built. So you can see it looks like it was sort of built in the garage. Uh, and effectively, there is a, uh, an approach to vibrating the on the bone, the long bone that sits in the forearm, uh, and measuring the resonance response back. And based on the response of vibration you get back, you can estimate the stiffness of the bone. It's through a three-point bending test. Uh, and so they initially developed this prototype. They purchased some artificial bones. These were not real bones. These were just simulated bones. Uh, and they quantified the stiffness of the bones with this approach. Then they took them to sort of classical mechanical testing approaches to see how did our measurements uh, relate to these classical measurements if you actually crush or break the bone. Uh, and they found that it was a very accurate and repeatable approach to quantifying the stiffness of these artificial bones. And the first published paper on this uh, was in 2014 in the Journal of Biomechanics. This subsequently led um, to Ohio University funding our research group to try and uh, further refine the technology and ultimately try to commercialize the technology. Uh, this is an article from 2016 that appeared in one of the Ohio publications titled Innervation Strategy Supports New Osteoporosis Diagnosis. Uh, you can see Ann, who I mentioned originally here, as well as Lynn and myself, uh, launching into this four years ago, trying to further refine and commercialize the technology. Uh, and since that time, we've made a lot of advances. Uh, this was our second prototype. You can see down here, uh, it still looks like it was built in a lab, uh, but it looks a little better than the first prototype. Uh, and since then, we've, uh, the, the major change with this particular design is we took out the human component. The initial component or the initial prototype involved us physically moving the little vibrating probe over the bone in very small increments. Here, we automated it using a Delta robot, so it was a more point-and-click technology uh, that's certainly going to be required to advance into the clinical utility stage. And you can see a number of different papers that we've published uh, recently. Uh, and then this is just a figure, you know, I'm a scientist, I like data, showing the relationship between uh, our novel measure of stiffness versus a classical gold measure of where we actually break the bone, and you can see it's a near-perfect association. Um, now, on the far left, I'm illustrating the current prototype, and as you can see, we're starting to get more to something that actually looks like something you may see in a hospital or at least a, a scientific laboratory. 
Uh, you can still see it's the same approach of vibrating the ulna. And the most recent work we've done was to try to see how well does our technology, which measures stiffness, which again is proportional to bone strength, do at discriminated degradations in the bone quality. So in this particular study, we took uh, human cadaveric arms, and some of them were, we, we, at baseline, we tested all of them for, for bone stiffness using our technology, um, bone stiffness using a gold standard technology that mechanical engineers would use, uh, as well as dual energy x-ray absorptiometry measures of bone mineral density. And then over time, we placed them in potassium hydroxide, or, or, or KOH, to degrade the collagen matrix and, and degrade the structural properties. And what I want to note here is that our technology, which we refer to as cortical bone mechanics technology, uh, detected about a 25% reduction in bone stiffness following being placed in this chemical milieu that's going to degrade the structural properties. Uh, and that was about the same that we saw with quasi-static mechanical testing, or the sort of the gold standard mechanical testing approach. But we saw absolutely no change in DEXA-derived measures of bone mineral density, which was consistent with what we expected, because again, the bone mineral density is a chemical composition as opposed to a mechanical property. So over the past couple of years, um, as, as Dr. Schill said, starting off, we've worked to try to commercialize this. Uh, AEIOU Scientific has subsequently licensed the technology, uh, and we have a small med tech startup that's operating out of the Ohio University Innovation Center. Uh, I should note uh, that we're currently working to convert AEIOU Scientific to a uh, uh, Delaware C Corp, and they're going to change the name to OsteoDX. Uh, it is an interesting story uh, that I like to tell as the scientist. The AEIOU actually stands for Ann, Ann Laux, the original. Um, founder of the lab. Uh, EI is the abbreviation for flexural rigidity or stiffness, so it's actually the quantitative property that we measure. And then OU, as you probably guessed, is for Ohio University. Um, and we've had a number of different sources of funding recently. Uh, it ranges from the uh, Department of Higher Education in Ohio, the Third Frontier, uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, and then this is not necessarily funding, but we did recently win uh, a statewide award from NASA uh, as it relates to uh, innovative technologies that have commercialization potential uh, that also has application to space flight because when astronauts go into space, they lose a substantial amount of their bone mass and they're very concerned that a long duration flight to say Mars could be limited by sort of bone structural degradation. Uh, lastly, I'll stop there. Uh, I've got my contact information here, both my email and my phone number, in case anyone would like to um, discuss this further with me. Thank you.